President of the United States. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, welcome home. I haven't seen him yet since he's back from his very busy trip. And yesterday, happy anniversary of your 39th birthday. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure for me to speak directly to you, the editors, publishers, and news directors in 35 cities from Utica to Tucson. Gannett represents one of the most creative forces in American journalism today. And under you, your able leadership, Al Newharth, uh, Gannett has 85 daily newspapers, 13 radio stations, six TV stations, and a successful new venture that's reshaping the print media, your nationwide newspaper called USA Today. Now, I am going to take your questions, but I can't let an opportunity like this go by to uh, say a few words about our economy and foreign policy with the hope that you will share a few of those words with your listeners, viewers, and readers. Uh, we've reduced the growth of government spending. We've pruned needless regulations and reduced personal income tax rates. We passed an historic tax reform called tax indexing that means that government can never again profit by creating inflation. And today, just over two years since these policies were put in place, we're seeing a vigorous recovery. The prime rate is only a little bit more than half what it was when we took office. Inflation has plummeted to 2.9% during the past year. Factory orders, retail sales, and productivity are all up from a year ago. And during the past 16 months, the stock market has risen sharply, boosting investment in productive sectors of the economy and raising the value of pension funds that so many millions of our people depend on. Unemployment is still too high, but last month, uh, it showed how fast it was dropping when it went down by a, nearly half a percentage point. Federal deficits pose a challenge, and some in the Congress are saying the answer is a tax increase. But it was tax cuts that gave birth to the recovery, and this recovery is boosting government revenues. Deficits are caused by government spending too large a percentage of the gross national product. The solution is for government spending to be reduced to a point that it neither causes a deficit nor interferes with the ability of the economy to grow. So I hope the Congress will help us reduce benefits by, or deficits by cutting spending, not by putting a bigger burden on the backs of the American taxpayers. Just as we're turning the economy around, I think we're bringing a new sense of purpose and direction to foreign policy. In Grenada, we set a nation free. In Central America, we're giving firm support to democratic leadership. And I believe that, thanks in large measure to the American example of what a free people can do, there's a rising freedom tide in the world today from Poland to Argentina and Venezuela. In Lebanon, the peace process is arduous and painful, but there has been some progress in spite of the continued horror tales that we are subjected to. Talks have begun to broaden the government's base and to satisfy legitimate grievances, and our goal and the goal must be internal stability and the withdrawal of all foreign forces. In Europe, the NATO alliance has held firm despite months of Soviet bluster. Sooner or later, the Soviets are going to realize that arms reductions are in their best interest. When they do, we'll be at the table waiting for them, ready to go on negotiating from strength and in good faith. As we pray for peace on earth in this holiday season, the American people should know that because we've strengthened our defenses and shown the world our willingness to negotiate, the prospects for peace are better than they've been in many years. I'm convinced that historians will look back on this as the time that we started down a new and far better road for America. And Al, could I just say again one other thing? I sure do like a press policy that is based on hope, legitimate hope and not just uh, undue optimism. I think the things that we've seen throughout this, the depths of this recession, prove the quality of the American people, 
that in the depths, the very depths of it, more money was given to charity and to worthy causes than has ever been given before uh, in our nation's history. Today, the, uh, the partnerships with schools, we call attention at the national level to the problem in education and suddenly business groups, communities, organizations are forming partnerships with schools throughout the country to help in whatever way they can. Name it and the people themselves are finding an answer for it. And uh, I think uh, you're right that I think when you look at a TV news program sometime in the national news and they have to announce that unemployment went down by uh, hundreds of thousands of people in just a one month period and then they immediately switch to showing some derelict sleeping on heating grates and so forth to take the taste out of your mouth of that good news that they just given is the only excuse I can find for doing that. But you must have some questions, so. Mr. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think he defers to you. <laughs> Mr. President, this group met this, I'm Al Newhart, <laughs> this group met this morning with George Steinbrenner, the owner of the New York Yankees. And he disappointed us by refusing to discuss his career plans for Billy Martin in 1984. <laughs> Would you wipe out some of that disappointment by talking with us about your 1984 career plans? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll be a little late with the answer. Uh, on January 29th, you shall know all. I will make a statement regarding my plans. And uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe what Mr. Steinbrenner is going by is the old baseball superstition that, you know, if you're pitching a no-hitter, don't say anything about it. That was one of the hardest jobs for me as a baseball announcer when I was a sports announcer. Be, pitcher and you're going into the seventh inning and he hasn't allowed a hit and I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't mention it because it's supposed to jinx him. I'm waiting for your decision the 29th because if you're not going to stay here, I want you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's nice to have an ace in the hole. I'm John Quinn of USA Today. Mr. Secretary just said he went around the barn on this question. I'd like to ask you, sir, your own views after the fact on the decision not to have uh, pool press at the Grenada action. And if that happened again, do you think that would be the policy to follow again? Not to have what? A pool press uh, representative. Well, I don't know how far George went around the barn, <laughs> but there was, no, there was no conscious decision by anyone uh, in his department over there or in the White House that said, now we must zero in and not let the press go. We only had 48 hours to plan that operation. We knew the Cubans were a lot closer than we were. The primary uh, concern, uh, as voiced by the chiefs of staff, was minimize casualties. So in that limited time, they planned what turned out to be a most successful and brilliant operation aimed at immediately getting to the locale of the some 800 students that were there and offering them protection and so forth. And I was responsible for only one part of that. I said that there's going to be a military operation in which civilians are not going to sit back here in the White House or in the government and look over the shoulders of the field, or field commanders who were there on the scene and they were going to run the operation. Now, it was only when some of you started squealing that I <laughs> discovered that uh, a part of one of their decisions had been that they would go in without press. I have to ask your understanding of this. The preparations that would have been needed, the word that would have had to go out, just offered too much of a possibility of leak. Uh, I have found out that the White House uh, I don't know how it holds the rain out. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I read memos in the paper that I haven't gotten yet. Uh, but we felt that it was absolutely imperative that we have the ultimate in security. We knew that a half a dozen other governments knew because they had uh, requested us. I'm going around the barn now, George. I, I have to tell you this, that even there, while we had to have some contact with them, we did not actually even declare to them that we were going in, that we were going to do it, or what our plans were. And uh, it worked. 
Now, I won't do, in any operation of the same kind, I won't do what someone suggested. And that is that, yes, sir, we guarantee the press go along and we put them right in the front row of the landing barges so they'll be the first <laughs> off. I won't do that. Yes. President, I'm Charles Overby from Jackson, Mississippi. And I've covered your campaign since 1968, and I've heard you give some stem winder speeches on tax deficits, budget deficits. Uh, what you said to us just a while ago, does that mean you're rejecting Secretary Regan's uh, contingency tax uh, increase? And uh, do you have in your own mind a, a how much of a budget deficit might be too much? I think any deficit is too much. I've been preaching for the last quarter of a century or more that government, well, we should have had the rule that Jefferson advocated back in his day when he said that the one thing lacking in the Constitution was a rule that the federal government could not borrow a penny. Now, you might have an emergency like war where you'd do that. But deficits, Deficits are the result of a disease. And to look always and focus on the deficit and ignore what brought them about. When you have deficits, the government is spending, taking too big a share from the private sector. And when it does that and over and above its revenues, you can go one of two ways. You can either borrow or you can raise taxes. But in either case, you are taking more money out of the private sector when that's already what the trouble is. So I think that the answer to deficits must be control of government spending and getting this government back to a certain percentage. I can't tell you what that exact percentage is, but I know it, that we're, we're taking too much now. There ought to be a point that we can figure out as the optimum point at which if you go beyond that percentage point in government taking from the private sector, you are interfering with prosperity and with a sound economy. And once decided on that point, we do that. So whichever way, borrowing or raising taxes, is just further going to harm the economy. We need to zero in. We've only gotten about 40% of what we asked for from 1981 on in uh, spending cuts. If we had gotten all that we asked for, the deficit today would be $50 billion less uh, than it is. So this is now on taxes. Yes, it could possibly be that in our organization, it's hard to tell with a recession whether the tax structure that we have in place is sufficient to match what we think should be the spending outlay. Once as recovery comes on, and we're sure that it is definite and we can do some measuring, we can look and see, did we overdo? Is there um, a room there for some tax increases? So what Don Regan was talking about was a contingency tax that says to the Congress, if you will make the cuts that are necessary and the cuts that we're going to ask for, and then that isn't enough, yes, we will have in mind as a contingency a tax increase then uh, to flesh this out and, and go after the rest of the, uh, the deficit. So I feel that way. I, I will make one promise. I, don't, I would resist and would veto any attempt at a tax cut that has passed for 1984. And as a matter of fact, uh, I, I believe the economy's got a better chance to continue recovering if there isn't one in 85. The original contingency tax we suggested would be one that would go into effect in 86 if the Congress had done what we said and had made all the cuts uh, that needed to be made. Or tax increase, I'm sorry, tax increase. Incidentally, let me just warn you about something that most people have forgotten. 1977, under the previous administration, they passed some Social Security reforms. And those called for years of increases in the Social Security tax. And those go all the way through the rest of this decade. Those increases alone are going to match the tax cuts that we have made already. All we did was head off further tax increases as to what they're taking out of your pockets. By the end of the decade, the tax rate is going up for Social Security to 7.65% from the employee and the employer. So that's more than 15%. And at the same time, every year virtually, they're increasing the amount of income against which that tax is assessed. 
So you're going to be having some tax increases, and they're not saying anything about those. I think what they want is, with people's tendency to forget, they want looking forward to the day when they can say they're my tax increases. I didn't pass them, and I don't want them. Christy Bulkley, editor and publisher of Danville, Illinois. The first federal pay grade is about 25% higher than the minimum <coughs> wage. Have you looked at that and considered reestablishing the minimum wage as the least pay level for jobs, just as we have to live with it? The minimum wage, I take it if I understand correctly, your minimum right. wage is... The lowest federal pay grade yeah. is 25% higher than yeah. the minimum wage is. We all have to live with the minimum wage as our lowest pay grade mm. for the least jobs. I've wondered if you've considered reducing that pay grade to the same level we live with, the minimum wage, as the, the lowest. Well, I can't recall anyone has proposed any such thing or that we've even discussed that, but I would have to tell you that I believe that a lot of our ills are due to the minimum wage. Uh, I think we have priced a number of people and jobs out of existence uh, by making the price for them too high. And if you go back, figures will bear out that every time the minimum wage increases, there is a an increase, particularly in young people who have no job skill to bring to the market. The very least that we should do, and we haven't been able to get any response uh, in Congress to this, the least that we should do is have two stages and have a lower minimum wage today for young people who are entering the job market for the first time and have no skill to bring it. They're the ones that are sitting on the sidelines because no one can afford to hire them. Point. Your lowest paying job in the federal government pays even 25% more yeah. than the minimum wage. And I, I guess I'm not sure that the least job in government is worth 25% more than the minimum oh. wage. <laughs> well, you'd get a lot of bureaucratic answer to that. <laughs> but uh, no, I think the minimum wage was really designed for the most menial of jobs, the jobs requiring no particular job skill, the entry jobs, and so forth. And I think it's been overdone, and as I say, it's, it's caused some of our problems. Incidentally, when you hear the, oops, wait, well, just let me say one more thing, and then I'll, she's going to tell me one more question, aren't you? All right. The, uh, um, let me say that the, uh, the biggest percentage of unemployment that's keeping our percentage level so high is for teenagers, young people. And... Uh, I somehow, sometimes think that this isn't a fair measurement of unemployment because would it interest you to know that almost 48% of those who are listed as unemployed teenagers are presently going to school. They're looking for after school jobs or weekend jobs. We all did. I did when I was uh, in school myself. But to tie that as a measure of the nation's unemployment and is, is kind of taking our attention away from the real problem, which is the wage earner with a family to support, the person that is out there with a job skill and no job uh, to which he can apply it. But I think we should ask some questions about unemployment. I asked one question at the Labor Department, and we've got a new answer already. I found out that they weren't counting our military as employed. <laughs> and now that they do, the unemployment rate is lower. Yes, sir. Mr. President, I'm Bob Ritter from Olympia, Washington. Do you currently have any contingency plans that uh, might include reducing military spending as a way to, uh, to uh, decrease the deficit? On military spending, I ran on the idea that we had been starving our military for so long that there really was a window of vulnerability. I think we've closed largely that window of vulnerability. We haven't closed it completely. We haven't caught totally up. But we've made a great difference. Now, with malice aforethought, I asked Cap Weinberger to take that job. He was my finance director for a time when I was governor. And he didn't earn the name Cap the Knife uh, for nothing. But what everyone, particularly in the Congress, seems unwilling to admit is that they have been themselves over there, under his direction, reducing the budgets uh, as they find ways to save and ways to improve. All these horror stories recently about the high price of spare parts, those are our figures. 
we're the ones who found those high prices. And we're the ones who are doing something about it. And we've already had a number of indictments. We have had refunds. Uh, we've had dismissals of personnel. We're getting at that. We sent some inspectors out that were mean as junkyard dogs. And uh, they found that this was going on. But uh, the way I feel that we have to look at defense is this. You look at defense not as how much do we want to spend. What is necessary to assure our national security? What weapon systems, what numbers of personnel and all? And once you've decided on that, then you figure out, and figuring just as sharply as you can with a sharp pencil, what does it cost to provide that kind of national security? And if you've gotten it down to where all the waste is out and we've taken advantage of our uh, reduction of inflation below what our anticipation was, I can tell you that right now the defense budget that is presently being talked about has been cut by the Secretary of Defense $16 billion before he came in with it. Now, to go to the Congress with this and then have them say, oh no, we only want to spend X number of dollars, then you have to say to the Congress, all right, then what is it that you want to do without? What weapon system do you, do want, to, do you want to do away with? Or do you want to cut the pay uh, for the military? I, I can tell you that when I started here, everyone said that which of high school graduates in the military that we have ever had in our history, even back in wartime when we were drafting so many millions. We have the highest percentage above average, the average intelligence level in the military. We have a waiting line of people who want to enlist uh, in the service. We have the highest retention now of non-commissioned officers. When we came here the first year, if we had gone to a draft we didn't have enough non-commissioned officers to train the draftees. And that's all changed. And I tell you, when I get a letter from 100 Marines stationed over in Europe, and those Marines write me, as they did about a year ago in the budget talk, and say, if giving us a pay cut will help our country, cut our pay. Uh, I wouldn't cut their pay if, <laughs> if I bled to death. They, uh, the response from them, all of them, and uh, is just so remarkable. Their pride there. I've made a lot of telephone calls, lately tragic calls, to families of those who've lost their lives. And uh, I hang up the phone in worse shape uh, than they were uh, on the phone. I've never heard such pride. I've never heard such willingness to accept that, uh, that this was necessary. And I've learned that the hardest thing that a president will ever have to do, as far as I'm concerned, is issue an order that some of our uniformed personnel have to go into an area where there is a possibility of, of harm to them. That's the one, that's the only problem that ever causes me to lose sleep. But um, now I think that the military budget, the defense budget, uh, incidentally, when we set out over a five-year period, we had, we had expected to increase over the Carter proje projections for the next five years, $116 billion. We have already ourselves cut $79 billion out of that $116 billion increase. And still we have a military that is further up to readiness. Well, you saw the result in Grenada. And I wish you could have all been on the South Lawn when about 400 of those students from Grenada came there at our invitation, and we had 40 of the military back from Grenada, from all four branches, and to see them all the same age, roughly, the medical students and the military, and to see those students, they couldn't keep their hands off those, those uh, young men in, in uniform. They, everyone wanted to tell them personally that they had saved their lives. I had some come up to me and tell me that when they were escorted to the helicopters and there'd been gunfire all around, that our men in uniform placed themselves in a position that if there was firing on them, they would be hit, not the students. They shielded the students with their, their bodies. And uh, it was a wonderful thing to see. I've uh, I got a great deal of hope and optimism about the future of this country now. 
having weathered all the riots on the campus when I was a governor, to now see the quality of these young people and their dedication. I didn't mean to make a speech, but I can't help it. I'm all wound up on that particular well, thank you, subject. President. All right. Thank, well, you. thank you all very much. Thank you.